job to appropriate funds because we know these funds will have great multiplier effects throughout this country. So I very, very strongly urge colleagues to reject this amendment. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks time? What purpose does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would rise in, uh, in opposite. Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I rise to oppose the amendment, uh, and the same basically that I said before. We are below fiscal year 2010 levels. Uh, certainly, I, I believe the authorizing committee must set very strict parameters as to how these dollars should be used. Uh, but uh, we are below fiscal year 2010, and I would urge a no vote. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment Chairman. is. The gentleman from California is recognized. On that, I request a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of, 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment on the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number four, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Diaz Ballard of Florida. Purpose does the gentleman from Iowa seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order on the gentleman's amendment. A point of order is reserved. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I recognize that this amendment is subject to a point of order, uh, but I'd like to discuss what this amendment is attempting to address. As we all know, the Community Development Block Grant Program, which is known as the CDBG uh, Grant Program, is one of the most widely utilized sources of assistance by local governments. Uh, these block grants are intended to address housing, community development, economic development needs as determined by, by local officials. Uh, this, this amendment, Mr. Chairman, is very straightforward. It, it, it simply gives greater flexibility to local communities, to the cities and the counties, et cetera, for part of their uh, CDBG funding. Uh, it increases the cap of what is known as public services expenditures from the current 15 percent up to 25 percent. Now public services, in, in reference to this legislation, deals with issues like child care, senior services, disabled services, educational programs, medical services, transportation services, domestic violence, crime, crime prevention, food banks, and others. The current 15 percent uh, public service cap was enacted into statute over 30 years ago. And it frankly just doesn't reflect the reality of today. So we all acknowledge, obviously, the tremendous fiscal challenges that we are facing here in Congress, that our country is facing. But we also acknowledge, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the challenges that our local communities are facing. CDBG public services funds have, have, have really played a key role in providing crucial aid to our most at risk, our most vulnerable populations, especially during difficult times like these. The restrictive and, frankly, outdated cap has denied many communities, Mr. Chairman, the option of providing their residents with the most basic services within the framework of the existing CDB, CDBG program. So this amendment provides flexibility to, to local leaders to meet certain unique challenges. Now, I want to make something very clear. This amendment does not increase or decrease CDBG funds, does not change the formula, and does not require those communities that are entitled to use more of their funds on public services. It simply grants certain, those cities and counties greater flexibility in their usage of certain CDBG funds. Let me mention that my colleague, Congresswoman Ross Layton, has a standalone uh, piece of legislation that I'm uh, uh, honored to be a co-sponsor co of. Uh, and it's imperative that the authorizing committee, the Financial Services Committee, work to update uh, the CDBG program for a lot of reasons. I also need to mention that Chairman Latham is well aware of these concerns. I want to thank him and his staff for really trying to accommodate uh, us on this issue, but unfortunately we were not able to do it at this time for a number of different reasons. Uh, I'd like to continue to work with Chairman Latham and the Financial Services Chairman, Chairman Bacchus, on, on finding 
real solutions that will give local communities flexibility to meet their unique challenges and to make sure that those funds are well utilized. At this time then, uh, actually now, Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to do is yield back the remaining part of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes, gentlelady from Florida, rise? Mr. Uh, Chairman, I move to uh, strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman. And I rise to support the uh, diaz Ballard amendment and to draw attention to a crisis that uh, will soon hit the city of Miami and uh, many other cities throughout South Florida, our state of Florida, and indeed throughout the nation. We are all aware of the difficult funding decisions that will need to be made by many departments and programs. Programs like the Community Development Block Grants may see overall reductions because of the sad realities of the uh, current budget constraints and in the interest of fiscal responsibility. However, because of an arbitrary Community Development Block Grant uh, expenditure cap, cap, countless uh, vulnerable citizens in the city of Miami and throughout the United States will lose their only means of sustenance. This amendment is not about increased funding, Mr. Chairman, nor is it about changing the overall formula of the Community Development Block Grants. It is simply about providing greater flexibility to cities on how they allocate their CDBDG funds. Currently, only 15% of Community Development Block Grant funds can go toward public services. Now what is public services? Well, they include food for senior citizens, the disabled, the homeless, the abused or neglected children. They also may be used for child care, for health services, for job training services. The city of Miami, of which I am I'm proud to represent, currently provides these vital services, especially meals through the uh, current uh, Community Development Block Grant public services. But because of the overall decrease in CDBG allocations, many disadvantaged men, women, and children will be without the vital support that they deserve and need. This amendment is simply a painless solution to this development, allowing cities the flexibility they need in how they expand their CDBG funds. It would allow up to 25% of CDBG funds to go to public services, a position that has been endorsed by the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities. The current 15% public service expenditure cap was enacted with the original statute over 30 years ago. It does not reflect the evolution of this program nor the necessity to provide flexibility to local leaders on how funds should be expended during this time of belt tightening. The current restrictive and outdated limit has denied many communities the option of providing their residents with the most basic and necessary services within the framework established by the program. CDBG public services have played a key role in providing crucial aid to our most at-risk and vulnerable constituents, especially during this enduring recession. Cities across our country have had to do more with less, and uh, this amendment will help them accomplish just that. I wish to thank uh, Chairman Latham and his staff in working with Congressman diaz Villard and me on trying to give this flexibility through the proper channel to our local leaders. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of our time. Gentlelady yields back. For person, purpose, does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Strike the last word. Gentleman's rec. I thank the chairman, and the gentleman, uh, I just wanted to. Gentleman will uh, suspend. Does the gentleman continue to reserve his point of order? I do. Point of order is reserved. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, uh, I just want to uh, to make the point uh, that I want to continue to work with these two great members from Florida. And uh, it is a real problem for the community, and uh, uh, I would be more than happy to, you know, I will do everything possible to try to be of assistance uh, with addressing this real problem for them. And with that, uh, I would yield to the gentleman from uh, Miami. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I want to thank you and your staff uh, who have been great on this issue, understanding the, the problem. And at this time, then, I would ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, to withdraw my amendment. Is there objection? Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn.
For what purpose does the gentleman from, from Maryland seek recognition? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise to engage in a colloquy with the distinguished chairman of the Subcommittee on Transportation, HUD, and related agencies, Mr. Latham, and also with Mr. Wolf on the driver alcohol detection system for safety or DADS. And I yield to the gentleman from Iowa. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would be glad to engage in the colloquy with the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, and the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Wolf. I thank the chairman. Um, as, as the gentlemen are aware, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, has been working on a public-private research program known as the Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety, or DADS, that would develop a passive technology to detect if a driver's blood alcohol content is above the legal limit. I would urge the chairman to consider funding for the DADS program as this bill moves forward, and I yield to the gentleman from Virginia. I, I thank the gentleman from Maryland and rise to support uh, his initiative. Mr. Chairman, too many times a mother or a father or a loved one has gotten that dreaded call in the middle of the night that someone has been killed in an accident involving a drunk driver. And I appreciate my friend from Maryland raising the DADS program and also urge my good friend, the chairman, uh, to look at this program as the bill moves forward. I yield to the gentleman from Iowa. Uh, I thank the gentleman from uh, Maryland and Virginia. I appreciate their taking the time to raise this very important issue. Uh, I will be mindful of their concerns as the process moves forward. And I would appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to my time. Right. Thank you. Yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk has not read to that point yet. Clerk will read. Page 90, line 13, Community Development Loan Guarantees Program Account, $6 million to remain available until September 30, 2014. Home Investment, Investment Partnerships Program, $1 billion, $200 million. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 11, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. McClintock of California. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment eliminates funding for the Community Development Loan Guarantee Program. Like the Community Development Block Grants that we just discussed, uh, these loan guarantees support strictly local projects that have no federal nexus. Now, unlike the House Appropriations Committee, President Obama has requested no taxpayer subsidies for this program, and that's a pretty profound statement. Remember, this is the same president who had no problem pay placing billions of taxpayer dollars at risk for failed schemes like Solyndra, for which he was soundly and rightly criticized by many in this House. But even the architect of the Solyndra fiasco is unwilling to risk taxpayer money on this loan guarantee program. So enter the House Appropriations Committee that apparently has money to burn. What are the recent projects funded by these loan guarantees? Well, seven million dollars went to the city of Hartford to buy a 393-room Hilton Hotel. Fifteen million dollars went to build a movie studio in Norristown, Pennsylvania. A $10 million loan to Bass Pro Shops to redevelop the Memphis Pyramid. Now, why would we put our taxpayers' money at risk for these ventures? Obviously, private investors were unwilling to risk their own money. Obviously, President Obama sees these loans as far riskier than anything that he's loaned in the Solyndra fiasco. But we're about to put our constituents' hard-earned money at risk to prop up these projects. Now, when Bass Pro Shops takes $10 million to redevelop the Memphis Pyramid, will this mean more jobs in Memphis? Well, yes. 
And will it mean precisely that many fewer jobs in other regions as once again we take from one community to give to another? Unfortunately, the answer is yes to that question as well. My amendment simply takes taxpayer exposure to these risky loans down to the level of fiscal restraint proposed by the least fiscally restrained president in the history of our nation. I'd invite my Republican colleagues on the Appropriations Committee to follow and yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts rise? Mr. Chairman, um, I rise um, to claim uh, time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, here we have kind of uh, the yang that went with the yin. Um, the, uh, the gentleman's amendment here a few minutes ago, the last one that he offered, was three and a half billion dollars. Uh, and taking that out of this uh, allocation. In this case, it's a $6 million amount. That's about, uh, that's about uh, 5,000 times as much as the uh, six, as the, uh, the first was five, to thousand times as much as this one. Maybe I'm off by an order of magnitude. I'm not quite sure. But uh, the, this amendment, I, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. Uh, the, the gentleman from California has pointed out that the president uh, did not want to do this at all. Well, actually, the president had, uh, had, er, had asked the committee to uh, to create a user fee to pay for this rather than the mechanism whereby this uh, rather small, really very small pro program, six million dollar program of loan guarantees has been functioning, which, uh, which was uh, to, to, um, to pay for if there was any risk involved, which the gentleman is claiming, if there was any serious risk to pay for it out of uh, uh, the, uh, the subsequent year's allocations under CDBG. So it turns out that for, every, for those places who would use this program, the loan guarantee program, that there has never been a penny loss for the federal taxpayers in this program on any of the S Section 108 projects that, uh, that we have uh, issued. And there have been a number of them. Uh, it, it actually is one of the most flexible, one of the most creative ways that you can use community development loan guarantee program is exceedingly flexible and very creative. It has been used uh, to uh, create a larger projects, projects that create jobs that may revitalize, be part of a revitalization of a, a whole target area. And it always ends up bringing in substantial addition, additional private investment into the neighborhood. So it's creating jobs. It is used often for the reuse of uh, of old factory buildings that have, uh, are no longer uh, viable in the form that they were, particularly in my part of the country, it's been used in that kind of a way, and, and successfully to make a, uh, a project that may turn out to be housing, may turn out to be a business incubator, or whatever. So this, this, is, a, this is a very flexible program and one that the federal taxpayer has never lost money on. Uh, you know, the creation of jobs and the development of, of uh, new businesses that come into a, a place that may be part of a development of this sort, the, uh, 
The creation of those jobs is what gives us a robust economy. And a robust economy is the best way we have, a robust economy is the best way we have of reducing the, uh, the deficit because you can end up cutting and cutting and cutting programs and if you do not end up creating jobs in, uh, in, the, in the long run, you're simply not going to return to a robust economy. That we, I think we know that. So I rise in opposition I, uh, to this amendment. I think it is uh, a counterproductive thing to do. It's very small. It has never lost any money. It operates quite well. The chairman, with my assent, though he didn't need my assent, but with my assent, certainly uh, uh, left it in there, and, uh, has, and I support his, his uh, position very strongly. I urge the uh, defeat of this amendment, and now you've lacked the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arkansas rise? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I also oppose the amendment. The Community Development Block Grant Program is very important to cities and states uh, throughout our country. As a former mayor, I can attest to the fact of uh, the impact that community development block grants have on our local communities. Uh, this year, we had many members, uh, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, request funding uh, for CDBG programs. For many members, there's strong constituent support uh, for the program. The Section 108 CDBG loan guarantee is, good, is a good community development tool uh, because it does something that we should be interested in doing, and that is leveraging funding. Uh, with only $6 million provided in the bill, HUD is able to make nearly a quarter of a billion dollars in loan guarantees for community development. So it's a small amount of federal money that creates a, a pretty significant impact. Uh, now, if a fee is warranted, uh, we would encourage the authorizing committee to enact legislation to create a fee and lower uh, the cost of the uh, program. So I urge a no vote on the amendment, and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not Mr. agreed chairman. to. The gentleman from California. On that, I'd ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. The clerk will read. Page 91, line 3, Home Invest Investment Partnerships Program, $1,200,000,000 to remain available until September 30th, 2015. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? I have an amendment to the desk uh, designated as Flake 1. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Flake of Arizona, page 91, line 7, up to the dollar amount. I ask consent that it be considered read. Without objection. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman. Uh, this amendment would uh, cut $200 million from the Home Investment Partnership and transfer the saving to the, uh, savings to the deficit reduction account. This simply uh, takes the level of funding to where it was last year. Uh, we're, we're often told we need to cut spending. I think we need to. But yet, uh, with this program, we're actually increasing the funding from $1 billion to $1.2 billion. So about a 20% increase. This is the uh, largest federal block grant to state and local governments uh, uh, designed exclusively to create affordable housing for low-income households. In 2011, a nationwide investigation by the Washington Post described the program as, as, quote, a dysfunctional system that delivers billions of dollars to local housing agencies with few rules, safeguards, or even a reliable way to track projects. This was the Washington Post saying this. It wasn't some conservative Republicans. This is the Washington Post. According to the Post, quote, these lapses have led to widespread misspending and delays in a two-decade-old program meant to deliver decent housing to the working poor. Um, nearly 700 projects awarded $400 million have been idling for years uh, while the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has largely looked the other way. It does not track the pace of construction and often fails to spot uh, defunct deals 
Instead, they're trusting local agencies to police projects. Again, this is a quote from the investigation. In 2009-2010, HUD's Office of uh, Inspector General came out with reports that questioned not only HUD's ability to monitor, monitor these home project funds, but also whether the program was in compliance with its own rules. In addition, several members of Congress have acknowledged concerns about HUD's ability to ensure that home funds are used in a way that produces the program's intended results. The Financial Services Full Committee has held uh, congressional hearings in response to these concerns. And in a spending bill last year, just last year, Congress included language that placed additional restrictions on the use of home funds for FY12. Problem is, those are the funds that are being implemented now. We don't even know if they are following the guidelines and doing what we asked them to do. And yet here, we're appropriating 200 million more dollars to them rather than saying, hey, we wanted you to do these things. Let's check and see if you've done them before we award you with more money. Um, it's difficult to evaluate these projects uh, when they haven't been done yet. So the, the, that's the reason we ought to cut back and simply go level funding with last year. Again, it's not a cut from last year. It's level funding from last year. It's the least we can do when we're running these kind of debts, or these kind of deficits, and we have this kind of debt, and, and we've found massive, massive problems with this program. The remedy isn't to award, you know, a 20 percent increase. Uh, if anything, we ought to be cutting the program. I'm simply saying with this amendment, let's take it back to where it was last year. What is the point of oversight uh, that we exercise here in Congress? If we exercise that oversight, we find problems, we ask for a remedy, and then we award money before we even see if the remedy uh, was actually entered into. Um, we have oversight here. We have the power of the purse. Let's use it. Uh, this program is troubled. It has problems. It's not just people on one side of the aisle that recognize that. The Congress as a whole does. So why in the world are we awarding 20 percent more funding this year than we had last? This amendment would take it back to last year's funding level. I urge its adoption and uh, yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. For what purposes does the gentlelady from Florida rise? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, I rise today to speak on the Transportation and Housing and Urban Development Appropriation Bill on the floor. Uh, first off, I want to say that whether it's the mayor of Jacksonville, Florida, Orlando, California, Texas, every single mayor that I've talked to, Democrats or Republicans, support community development block grant and are very concerned about what we're doing here and making sure that we send funds that they can decide how the community is to use the funds to meet their needs. In addition, I want to talk about transportation. I've been on the Transportation Committee for the entire 20 years that I've been here in the Congress. And transportation has always been bipartisan. It did not matter who the president was. It did not matter who the speaker was. In fact, when Newt Gingrich was the speaker and President Clinton was the president, the House Transportation passed the bill over both of them and funded the Transportation Committee for six years. This House have not been able to pass a transportation bill. And for the first time, you see people who really don't want to put America to work because transportation is the committee that put the American people to work. When you look at the engineers or architects, they rate America as a D minus as far as our infrastructure is concerned. But yet you have people that do not want to put the American people back to work. My home state of Florida, we received close to $3 billion for a high-speed train from Orlando to Tampa. Well, what did we do? We sent it back. Well, 18 states have our money, and they are putting people to work. We're talking about transportation money. So when you have people with other agendas besides putting people to work, 
that is a real problem in the area of transportation. We know that for every billion dollars we invest, it generates 44,000 permanent jobs. But yet, you have people in this house with a different agenda. And their agenda, agenda has nothing to do with jobs, 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 and putting people to work. It is a sad, sad state of affairs. But I've often said you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. Position to the amendment that uh, is uh, sensibly before us. Gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Gary and I have got an amendment on the tornado in Tuscaloosa. We've been here for an hour. And we were the last one. We thought we had an agreement that y'all would do this. Uh, we're after. working on the flank amendment. Yeah. Okay. I'm not in control of the goddamn time. The time is in control of your your chairman. <laughs> Pardon, my time is running. Oh. Sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the we we are talking about the amendment uh, that uh, the gentleman from Arizona has offered. And, and he has offered an amendment that would take $200 million out of the Home uh, Investment Partnership Program as allocated, as, as recommended by uh, Chairman Latham and the subcommittee and through the procedures of the uh, subcommittee and the full committee actions uh, uh, before coming to the floor. Uh, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. Um, there have been some controversies with the home program, the home uh, part investment partnership program, but there were statutory changes last year uh, and, uh, and uh, HUD is now in the process of finish, finishing the rule to, to uh, go along with those statutory changes. So, uh, and so those reforms are now basically in place. Uh, there has been, uh, as to my understanding at least, there has been no instance of our actual loss of money from the uh, Home Partnership Program at any time, uh, but there have been projects that have been stalled. This is one of the um, uh, few programs that we have in this bill that actually produces housing that actually results in the construction of housing. And most affordable housing projects use multiple sources to complete a uh, development. And, uh, and occasionally, it is possible that, uh, that the private monies, the development monies, don't, don't uh, materialize to a project that has been approved for the Home Partnership Program. And if that ca happens, then HUD takes the money back and uses it someplace else. It doesn't end up getting in, in any way resulting in a loss to the, to the uh, taxpayers of the country. So the, uh, the, the home program uh, is, as I say, one of the few programs that actually funds new construction, newly constructed housing. Uh, in, in, under this uh, legislation. And uh, these funds are, are used. They provide needed jobs in our communities. They, un they ease the unemployment in the construction sector. They produce housing. And they don't end up costing the taxpayers any money. So to the degree that that is uh, followed and, uh, and, and we can produce housing, then, then yeah, I am certainly in strongly in favor of it and strongly supported Chairman Latham's uh, assignment of the additional money. 
I would point out that the level of the funding at the level that has been recommended by the committee, by the, the uh, Appropriations Committee and by the subcommittee that uh, Mr. Latham chairs, that, that the amount of money that has been assigned is below the amount that was assigned back five years ago in, uh, it, for the 2008 budget. We have been through an ups and downs on this one over time, and uh, I certainly would urge an, a no vote on the gentleman's amendment, and I yield back uh, my time. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? The gentlelady from Ohio is recognized. Thank you uh, very what much, you Mr. Rise? Mr. Chairman. I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of our esteemed ranking Does member. Does the gentlelady move to strike the last I word? I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized for five Thank minutes. Thank you. I um, rise to associate myself with the remarks of our esteemed ranking member, uh, John Oliver of Massachusetts, and say I oppose Mr. Flake's uh, proposal. Now, if Mr. Flake came to the floor, although I don't support uh, support cuts in home with the devastation that's occurred across our housing market, but he would take the money from the Central Arizona Water Project, or if he would take the funds from the major federal monuments that are stacked wall to wall in the state of Arizona, or if he yield? would take the funds from all the defense facilities that help to employ and hold up the economy of your state. It's very interesting where he cuts money from. Among the poorest people in this country, some of the most devastated parts of America that they're trying to rebuild themselves. With the general it's very interesting yield? Uh, to me uh, when he proposes amendments, whether it be this one or other ones in subcommittee, you always leave your home turf sacrosanct. It's very, very interesting. Yes, I'd be interested in the gentleman's response. Thank you. This, for all I know, this cuts money from my district as well. I have not discriminated in where I've taken money from. I think everybody who's followed the process over the past several years knows that. Uh, with regard to the Central Arizona Project, Arizona repays the federal government to the tune of about $55 million a year. Still, after all these years, the fact that we are 83 percent publicly owned in Arizona means that our local communities have to, uh, have to uh, run their facilities and run their services on just a narrow sliver of well, private land. If the land. gentleman would allow me so to I'm reclaim to... my time, if one looks at the defense bases uh, across northern Ohio, we don't have anything like Arizona has. I mean, if we look at the kind of subsidy we are providing for water in the West, for Bureau of Land Management projects, for all of the investments that have been made to allow Arizona to even get water, to even get water, then to say to the part of the country that said, well, we want the West to develop. We're going to help you out. And now you say, no, 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 you know. Now we're going to take money away from Cleveland and Toledo and Detroit and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Chicago and Milwaukee, all of the places that tax themselves for the development of the modern West. So I would say to the gentleman, I think your, the answer to the problem we have is economic growth. And we have to invest in that. The housing sector has been dead in the water uh, for since 2008, largely because of uh, the non-regulation of the uh, Bush administration during those years when the derivatives were created. So we, we look at what happened back then, but please don't take it out of the hearts on the hides of the most stressed communities in America that, despite all the odds, are in the process of reinvesting and rebuilding themselves. So I just want to associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Oliver, oppose the Flake Amendment, support programs that will help the revitalization of the housing sector of this country. Yield back the lady yields back. What purpose does a gentleman from... What purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? I rise. Um, I have an amendment at the desk what? to move the strike. The, the, the chair will first dispose of the Flake Amendment. Okay. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, on that, I would ask for the ayes and nays. The gentleman is asked for a recorded, recorded vote. vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. 
The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Bacchus of Alabama. For what purpose does a gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this, I uh, reserve a point of order on the gentleman's amendment. The point of order is reserved. Thank you. All right, and uh, let me acknowledge that a point of order uh, is due to be granted. Uh, I'm, however, here to uh, ask for the cooperation of the uh, appropriating committee as we move forward uh, on addressing a problem that we found as a result of the many tornadoes that devastated our country last year. Uh, and I will use an example of the city of Tuscaloosa. Uh, in the aftermath of the tornado that struck Tuscaloosa on April the 27th, uh, HUD came in and calculated the loss of, uh, of residences and rental units. Uh, part of their charge was to uh, replace the critical needs. However, and I'll just use one census tract as an example, uh, they came into a census tract that includes uh, University Boulevard, which is a census tract made up almost entirely of rental units. However, according to HUD's calculation, uh, they came in and they simply surveyed the owner-occupied units. Now, there were 23 owner-occupied units that were destroyed in the census tract but there were 440 rental units that were destroyed in the same tract. So almost all the loss of property was, uh, habitable, was uh, rental units. Uh, it left the city of Tuscaloosa, a university town, woefully inadequate uh, in its number of, of rental units. Uh, in their calculation, they only take the uh, owner-occupied units, and they extrapolate from that uh, what they consider the number of rental units to be uh, in that same census tract. Well, you can't really base uh, a calculation of how many rental units there are based on how many uh, owner-occupied dwellings they are. And to tell you how much they missed it, uh, they calculated that uh, there were no rental units destroyed, uh, which is obviously a, a tremendous miscalculation. So we've offered an amendment today which essentially will say uh, that you have to consider and your survey must include both owner-occupied units and rental units and um, that you must calculate both of them, not simply the owner-occupied units. Uh, HUD's model, in short, needs to be changed. Uh, we believe that we, uh, our authorizing committee, will correct this in future cases, but there's an urgent need to replace uh, rental housing that was lost in last year's tornadoes throughout the nation. And our amendment simply creates a, a mechanism to do so and directs HUD to develop a formula for distributing assistance to communities that have already suffered damage. And uh, this will restore what we think is fairness and a more correct calculation. And with that, I reserve. I, I will yield back. Gentleman may not reserve. Do you yield back? Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentle lady Mr. Chairman, I seek point of order. Mr. Speaker. Gen the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I this time make a point of order uh, against the amendment uh, because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislating in an appropriations bill and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. Uh, so therefore, again, I do make a point of order. Does any member wish to be heard on the point of order? I if point of order is pending. The chair is prepared to rule. The chair finds that this amendment includes language imparting direction to the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. The amendment therefore constitutes legislation in, viola in violation of Clause 2 of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. What purpose does the gentlewoman from Alabama I move to strike Alabama the last arrive? word. 
General Lady is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, um, I understand the point of order, but I want, rise today in support of this amendment by my fellow colleague from Alabama, which adds critical funding to assist communities devastated as a result of last year's severe weather. This bipartisan amendment would add $200 million to the underlying bill and direct it towards communities that receive CDBG disaster assistance in FY 2012. Prior to the awarding of these, these new funds, this amendment would direct HUD to establish a formula of funding that would give preference to applicants based on counties' unmet housing need that would include renters unoccupied and renters occupied units. Currently, there is still an ongoing and urgent need for housing options, particularly rental units across several parts of my district as well as my colleagues' district. This amendment would help communities like Tuscaloosa, Alabama receive adequate funds to help repair and rebuild rental housing units that were destroyed by the, August, by the April 27th tornadoes. This would help to provide rental housing units that would provide critical shelter for women, children, and families. A recent report released by HUD estimated that the amount of unmet housing needs for Tuscaloosa County alone would exceed $56 million. Most of this figure was associated with unmet rental housing need. The devastation and destruction that was caused by the April tornadoes across the state of Alabama is still being felt, especially in places that have already had economically disadvantaged areas. This amendment would provide the additional funds needed for these affected areas to continue their efforts towards full recovery. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. While I understand the, the point of order, I really would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on this amendment. Thanks. The gentlelady yields back. The clerk will read. Page 92, line 17, self-help and assisted home ownership opportunity program, $60 million to remain available until September 30th, 2015. Homeless assistance grants, including transfer of funds, $2 billion of which $1,995,000,000 shall remain available until September 30th, 2015. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Clark of Michigan, page 94, line 19. After each of the first and second dollar amounts, insert increase by $5 million. Page 95, line 4. After the dollar amount, insert increase by $5 million. Page 110, line 9. After the dollar amount, insert reduced by $5 million. Gentlemen's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer this amendment on behalf of citizens who feel they have no voice in this Congress, people who have given up hope altogether. These are citizens who earn money by scavenging through alleys to find empty bottles and cans and get their return deposits. They survive by rummaging through garbage dumpsters to find food to eat. These are citizens who have no place to live. They're on the street. According to the Detroit Rescue Mission Ministries, every night in the city of Detroit, there are nearly 20,000 people who are in need of shelter and who are homeless. Nearly a quarter of these people are children. And what is perhaps most tragic is that many of these citizens, and I've spoken to them as I've seen them in the alleys, are men who have sacrificed themselves who have proudly served this country in the military. Many of the homeless in the city of Detroit are veterans. Some of the folks on the street I know personally, I grew up with them. They need help. They need substance abuse treatment. They need a place to stay. And in Detroit, because of the housing crisis, because foreclosures force many people out of their homes, we also have many apartment buildings that are now vacant. 
vacant but could be rehabilitated and renovated to provide a home to our veterans who are currently on the street. This amendment that I offer will add $5 million to homeless assistance grants to provide our homeless veterans with a home, but also with the hope and dignity that all Americans deserve. Mr. Chair, I ask for your support. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Iowa is recognized. I, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I would minutes. just uh, tell the gentleman that we accept your amendment and yield back. Gentleman from Iowa yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Thank you. The gentleman, for what purpose does the gentleman from Iowa seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the remainder of the bill through page 134, line 11, be considered as read, printed in the record, and open to amendment at any point. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Any amendments to, of that, to that portion of the bill? Mr. Chairman, to line 14, so whenever you're there, I'm, I'm ready to go. The clerk will read. Page 134, line 11. Page 134, line 12, section 234 of Title II of Division K of Public Law 110-161 is amended. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. LaTourette of Ohio, page 134, after line 14, insert the following new section, section 235 notwithstanding the 13th proviso of the second undersigned paragraph under the heading Community Planning and Development, Community Development Fund, and Title 12 of Division A of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, Public Law 111-5. Oh, ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading, I'm sorry. Without objection, so ordered. For what purpose does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order on the gentleman's amendment. The point of order is reserved. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. I, I thank the chair very much, and uh, I thank the gentleman for reserving the point of order. And I think when I'm done consuming my five minutes, he'll perhaps uh, relent and, and think that that's a bad idea. Uh, the Neighborhood Stabilization Fund uh, has been a valuable tool all across America in helping to revitalize neighborhoods. I would suggest it has one, one fatal flaw. There are some homes in every community in America, whether it's Detroit, Los Angeles, Cleveland, where I'm from, where some homes just aren't coming back. And you can't revitalize the neighborhoods until you tear those houses down and start afresh. One of the difficulties with the Neighborhood Stabilization Fund is it restricts the ability for a local community to use those funds uh, to demolish homes. I will tell you from uh, touring a number of these properties in my good friend Marsha Fudge's district on the east side of Cleveland, uh, these are fire traps. These are rat traps. The last two Cleveland police officers who have been injured in the line of duty uh, have been injured as they entered uh, a dilapidated home. We uh, toured one home, uh, in fact, where uh, the expression everything but the kitchen sink didn't apply because people had actually taken the kitchen sink, the toilet, the wiring, the gutters, uh, and all of the copper. Uh, cities are stepping up all across the country to take care of this problem. In the state of Ohio, our Attorney General has devoted $75 million from the settlement with the top five big banks to this purpose. Mayor Jackson in Cleveland has expended a considerable amount of money. And Ms. Fudge and I have introduced legislation that would authorize uh, uh, bonds through the Department of Treasury to supplement the great work that land banks all across this country are doing. Uh, but because that bill languishes in the Ways and Means Committee, uh, this simple amendment uh, would give increased flexibility to communities that want to take uh, grants that they've received from the federal government to stabilize their neighborhoods to give them the opportunity to use them for demolition if they reach the conclusion that in order to protect the neighbors in that neighborhood who are paying their taxes, who are keeping up their house, who are paying their mortgage, but whose property values continue to plummet because they have this eyesore next door, that if the mayor of Cleveland or the mayor of Toledo or the mayor of Los Angeles 
reaches the conclusion that it's better in that instance to rip that house down and start over uh, and work with the land banks that are popping up all across the country and do that. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I would respectfully ask uh, passage of this amendment. Gentleman yields back. I do. For purposes, the gentleman from Iowa rise. Uh, Mr. Chen, uh, Chairman, I continue to reserve my point of order, but uh, I'd like to strike the last word. I was recognized for five minutes. I, I thank the chairman. Uh, I, I just want to tell the gentleman from Ohio that I have uh, uh, really no problem with the intent of his amendment uh, that I think he's uh, talking about something that is a, a very real to a lot of folks. Uh, my understanding is that waivers that have been asked for have all been accepted in the past and the secretary uh, has said that uh, if there's a waiver needed that they would be glad to oblige. But having said that, uh, I just want the gentleman to know the reason that you know, I insist on the point of order is simply for consistency on the bill so that we're not legislating and we have struck um, on point of order every other authorizing language uh, that has uh, come before the, uh, the subcommittee today or to the, to the floor. So uh, with that, while I have great uh, share his concerns and uh, that he has stated, uh, I must uh, insist on my point of order. Will the gentleman state his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation on an appropriation bill and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part, an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if changing existing law. The amendment waives existing law. And I ask for a ruling of the chair. Does any other member wish to make comment on the point of order? I do, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much, and I, I thank my great friend from Iowa for those, those kind words, and I know his heart's in the right place, even if his legislative uh, initiatives in this moment are not. A lot of people don't uh, realize the history of Rule 21, and I had great conversations in the past with, with uh, the prior parliamentarians, the last two, uh, Mr. Sullivan and, uh, and uh, Charlie, I can't remember Charlie's last name. But, uh, and we talked about the notion of equity, that we're not only bound by the rules of the House, but just like in courts all across the country, the chair has the power of equity in his possession. And Rule 21 has its origins in 1844, when John Quincy Adams, the only President of the United States to come back and serve in the House of Representatives, decided that the appropriations process was bogging down and therefore we should have Rule 21 to prohibit authorizing on appropriations bills. It was designed to keep uh, the appropriators from poaching on the territory of the authorizing committees. We don't have that here. The chairman of the authorizing committee was just here, Mr. Bacchus. He doesn't have any problem with this. The only person that is raising the point of order and has a problem with this uh, is the distinguished subcommittee chair of the Appropriations Committee. So that's my first argument on equity. Secondly, uh, because I had some spare time today, I also looked at the precedents uh, of the House. And I would suggest to the chair that this is a matter of first impression. Uh, the last time that this came to the floor, the uh, attention of the parliamentarian was in 2006. Uh, and sadly, there's a big problem with getting the congressional record online. But we did get the previous one, which is in 1995, when the gentlelady from uh, uh, Missouri at the time, Ms. Danner, who many of us remember, was attempting to uh, make a, a provision in order on the transportation. It wasn't transportation HUD at that time. It was the transportation appropriations bill. And in construing the context of Clause 2, Rule 21, the chair at that time indicated that what she was attempting to do is we have uh, uh, out of the Highway Trust Fund uh, 2.8 cents goes to transit. That yields a certain amount of money. And she was attempting to wall off $26 million to go specifically uh, to additional transit projects. The chair in that instance specifically, and I think correctly, uh, found that you cannot mandate or limit the discretion uh, of the secretary or another federal official, nor can you mandate that money be used in a certain way that's not contemplated uh, by the law. As a matter of fact, on uh, in section 1057 of the, uh, the House manual that we all revere here very much, 
It cites the indications where this has been considered before. And the common theme with all of them is that the person offering the amendment or the Appropriations Committee attempting to implement the policy was attempting to mandate action uh, on the part of a federal official uh, or mandate that money be spent in a certain way. And I brought up the June 2006, uh, June the 9th, 2006 ruling by the chair, uh, which occurs on page uh, 10,673 for those who may be following this at home. And in that instance, the the offending language was that the statement could not say that not less than a certain sum would be expended on that particular purpose. This amendment was very carefully crafted. And as the chair, I know, being a, a student of the law and parliamentary procedure, will note that we don't have the words not less than, it's not more than. Already, the existing legislation, the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, uh, contemplates that states who receive, so there's no change in the federal appropriation. If the city of Cleveland gets a $100,000 neighborhood stabilization fund, they get to spend it. Doesn't change. There's no federal involvement after that. It's then up to Mayor Jackson to figure out how to expend it. This already, uh, this expands the contemplated purpose of that that says that a portion is already permitted uh, to be used for demolition. This just says not more than. Uh, it's not a limitation. It just is increased flexibility for the communities that have received these grants. And honest to gosh, uh, you know, <laughs> with all of the problems that we have around this place, uh, to go back and violate the spirit of John Quincy Adams' understanding of why we needed Rule 21 to prevent state and local communities uh, to have the flexibility to demolish homes where fires are occurring, where people are selling drugs, where people are being murdered, is really beyond me. So I appeal to the chair, not only based upon the precedence of the House, but upon the inherent authority of the chair to exercise equity uh, and understand that my, there might be a, a T not crossed or an I not dotted in this particular instance, but the equitable arguments are on the side of this amendment, and I respectfully ask the chair to overrule the point of order. Does the gentlelady from Ohio wish to speak to the point of order? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I wish to speak to the point of order. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Yes, 